All right. Well, you know, I enjoy praising the Lord. Amen. I, I enjoy hearing His name praised in song. And, and uh, it's a really a blessing to my heart because I believe when, when the saints rejoice in the presence of God, I believe God smiles upon them. And when we rejoice in His presence and in His praise, and He is certainly worthy of our praise. In fact, He's the only one who is. Well, that's what worship is. Do you know that? It's uh, the word worship means worthyship, and uh, He is the only one who is worthy of our praise and adoration. Uh, who was and who is and evermore shall be. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the the Alpha, the Omega. He is the Creator of all things. He's the one who salted the sea. He's the one who colored the rainbow. He is the one who decreed that uh, water freeze at 32 degrees. He is the one uh, who made you and I. And so he is the beautiful rose of Sharon. He is the lily of the valley. He is the bright and the morning star. And as the songs of Solomon said, he is altogether lovely. And uh, who shall paint him uh, who was uh, and evermore shall be uh, the creator of uh, countless worlds. And uh, so this morning, I would like to invite you, if you will, please to uh, take your uh, Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy uh, and the third chapter. Uh, and I have preached from this uh, uh, chapter many times uh, over the years. And I want to uh, direct your attention to uh, verses 1 uh, through verse 5. And I want you to see it in a brand new light this morning. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Mm -hmm. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, mm -hmm. covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such. Turn away. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> bless the reading of your word and give us a great understanding of it, a mighty visitation of your spirit in our midst today. Convict us, Lord, of our sins. Convince us of your righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, <clears throat> I want you to notice something with me. There was in Greek mythology, y'all know, y'all understand what Greek mythology was, don't you? There was a, a man by the name of, or if I pronounce this correctly, Narcissus. And he was a strange kind of guy. And one day, he looked over in a clear pool of water and he saw his own reflection. And when he saw his own face, it was love at first sight. <laughs> now, I remember when I met Betty. It was love at first sight, Brother Bill. She fell in love with me immediately. It took me time, but she fell in love immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but now, Narcissus, that's the way it was with him. I mean, he saw himself and he fell in love with himself. There was a romance that was made in a pool of water. And so, uh, y'all heard the term narcissistic? Uh, that's where it comes from. And it means uh, 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 an attitude of, uh, 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 of self-importance. It means 
that a person is uh, enchanted by his own adequacy, his own sufficiency, and he is dedicated to his own power uh, and his own necessity. And that somehow or another, have y'all ever known anybody like that? I'm true. I'm really talking about a real serious. I'm not other than me. I'm talking about. Uh, you're not supposed to be thinking about me here, but uh, a real sure enough narcissist. I, I have known uh, a few narcissists in my time, and you know what they are really convinced. I had a man to tell me one time he I worked for him, and he told me he said. He said, I like for things to be done my way. And he said, the reason I want things done my way is because my way works. Your way doesn't work. Mine does. And I thought to myself, boy, I mean, this guy really, he truly does believe in himself. And he was convinced, I'm telling you, he convinced me. He had everybody that worked for him convinced that he was the smartest man on earth. And so uh, there are many narcissists, and this is precisely what Paul was talking about, about here in uh, 2 Timothy. But he said that because of this narcissistic attitude, because of this attitude of pride, and self-importance and this uh, craving of power and authority over other people, uh, there would come perilous times. It would lead to dangerous times. And because what it would do was, it would cause men to become lovers of their own selves. And that nothing would be more important than themselves. Now I want to say to you this. If you love yourself and you're the most important thing in your life, then you don't have much of a life. Because I have preached this and I believe this with all my heart. Unless there is something that you can find in this world, in this life, that you rank above yourself, then you have nothing to live for until you find something that you're willing to die for. And you, if you can find fa in family or in your brothers and sisters in Christ or if you can find it in your nation or if you can find something, most especially, and I preach God, if you can find uh, your faith in God that you can place above yourself something that you are willing to die for, then you will also have something to live for. And so, uh, but until you do, you don't have a reason to live. Now we live in, in a world that is possessed. And, and that, if you're listening for a title to my message this morning, that would be it. Possessed. Possessed with feelings of self-sufficiency adequacy, prestige, and power. And so, that, uh, there is another, and I, hey, I, can I get this word in? I want to, because I like to use it. Uh, it. And if that's the only reason I'm throwing it in here, it's because I, I want to hear myself say it. Megalomania. <laughs> Don't that sound good? No, it's not good. But you know what it is? It means that uh, a person is uh, uh, is uh, enchanted with his own power to have authority over other people, to have uh, control over other people, uh, to uh, have uh, uh, feelings of, uh, of grandeur for himself, that everyone else is beneath him. Have you ever met anybody like that? And uh, but it is uh, it, it becoming more and more common in our day and time. People like that become dangerous, uh, and uh, they uh, they are 
possessed with a, a feeling of, uh, it, it actually it becomes an insanity, if you please, uh, an irrational insanity. But <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, an example of a few people that were possessed with a type of insanity. <clears throat> they were driven by it. And to see if you know of anyone in this day and time like that. Governor Pilate, y'all remember him? Yeah, I've talked about him many, many times from this pulpit. But Pilate was driven by something. He was possessed by something. He was possessed by, maybe it was a fear. Maybe it was a yearn for power. Maybe it was for authority. Maybe it was for control. But it became an insanity to him. It became irrational, if you please. But it was a possession. He was possessed. I'm going to give you an example. Pilate declared Jesus not guilty three separate times. Many people, theologians in our day and time, believe that Jesus had, or Pilate had Jesus scourged in order to appease the people in order that, uh, that he wouldn't have to crucify him. But in the end, there was something that had possessed Pilate. And he surrendered and had Jesus crucified. It was a type of insanity. Uh, because what kind, of, what fear, what, what, what spirit, what dem demonic force could convince him that it would be better for him to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ, a man whom he knew was not guilty of the charges. And yet he did it anyway. So what was that madness? Uh, there, uh, there have been other people. And let me give you another example of this uh, insane possession that seems to grip our world today. How many of you have ever gotten the feeling that somehow or another the world and society was becoming more and more insane? Well, I believe it is. I believe we're drifting into a more and more insane, irrational uh, uh, belief. The Sanhedrin, the uh, Pharisees, the scribes. Think about this for a moment. Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And they knew that. They could not dispute that fact. <laughs> But they, when they saw the people leaving their church and following the Lord Jesus Christ, they suddenly found themselves at war with God. But in their logic, it was better for them. Now, you tell me if this is insane or if this is sane or insane. But in their logic, they thought that it was better to war against God in order to serve God. It's irrational. It makes no sense. And so they said to themselves, we must stop this man or else we will have our authority taken away from us. And so they agreed among themselves to crucify Jesus, a man whom they knew beyond any shadow of a doubt was the Messiah and the Son of God. And is that sane? Is that rational? But they were possessed with a madness. That was a driving force. I suggest to you today that Adolf Hitler was possessed with the same type of driving force, the same type of madness that thought somehow or another he could rationalize uh, genocizing an uh, entire race of people for the good of humanity. Is that sane thinking? No, it's not. It's an insanity. But where did it come from? Where did this force come from? Well, I'm going to tell you straight, straight out. It came from Darwinism. Survival of the fittest. That's where it came